good afternoon or good evening to everyone, wherever you are, because I suspect this webinar spans quite a few time zones. Um, so data-centric engineering uh, journal is at the interface of engineering sciences and data science. And we aim to explore the benefits of data science machine learning to improve reliability, resilience, safety, efficiency, usability of an engineered system. So this is very much at the core of this webinar series. Uh, I'm delighted to chair today's event. So it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome uh, to our speaker of the day, uh, Dr. Takemasa Miyoshi. Takemasa Miyoshi earned his PhD in meteorology in 2005 at the University of Maryland, uh, where he still holds a visiting professor position. He has held a number of prestigious positions in Japan and the US. And since 2012, he serves as team leader of the data assimilation research team from Riken, uh, one of the centers of Riken, uh, which is the Center for Computational Science. Um, he has received a number of honors and awards, the most recent being a commendation by the Japanese Prime Minister for Disaster Prevention last year. His talk is called Fusing Big Data and Big Computation in Numerical Weather Prediction. And Takemasa-san, thank you again for agreeing to speak. It's my great pleasure to, to welcome you to the webinar and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for arranging this seminar uh, at uh, early morning for you. And mainly because I'm in Japan and it's already about 7 p.m. So thank you very much for, for arranging this for the convenient time for me. Um, so let me share my screen. Okay. So today I'm going to talk about fusing big data and big computation in numerical weather prediction. And I, I would like to start with a two minute movie. So, so there will be a movie voice so if it doesn't play, uh, let me know. So it, it should say something. Takemasa Meoshi, team leader, data assimilation research team, Deakin. Data assimilation makes it possible to predict sudden downpours, a goal once considered unfeasible. Data simulation enables more accurate predictions by combining data from supercomputer simulations with actual observation data. Let's take a look at sudden downpours. A comparison found major differences between simulation data for sudden local downpours and the actual observation data. Rapidly feeding big data into a supercomputer using data assimilation has made more accurate predictions possible. Miyoshi's data assimilation research team has brought about a weather forecasting revolution. Research on how to use data assimilation in various other fields has already begun. Efficient use of renewable energy research to explore the mysteries of life itself, improving production efficiency and product quality, infrastructure control like preventing traffic jams, better understanding the global environment to live in harmony with nature. Through these and more, data assimilation will only become more important over time. Data assimilation links reality and simulations. Data assimilation links various research fields. Data assimilation links today and tomorrow. Data assimilation is a link to our future. Okay, so this is a summary of what I'm going to talk today. And if you would like to watch it again, here is the link to this uh, YouTube movie. So uh, let me first uh, briefly uh, talk about myself. So my background. So I graduated from the Kyoto University and then I started working for the Japanese government. The JMA represents the Japan Meteorological Agency. 
So it's a weather service. It's a counterpart of the UK Met Office. And I did the administrative work for the initial two years. And after that, I started working on uh, data assimilation and numerical weather prediction. And then I had a chance to study at the University of Maryland in a graduate school. And I had two years, very strict two years because of the Japanese government training program. And I was a Jap government employee at that time. And because I didn't have any graduate degree at that time, I uh, pursued master's degree uh, within this two year period, but I, uh, I worked very hard, as you can imagine, and I completed a PhD in this two year period. It's, it's said that uh, this two year is a record of the University of Maryland uh, to complete a PhD. I don't know if it's true, but it's still <laughs> many people say that. And then I went back to the JMA in numerical weather prediction. And at this time, I studied uh, the ensemble Kalman filter. That's one of the uh, advanced data simulation method. And I applied it to the, the real world uh, numerical weather prediction system at the Japanese weather service. And then I moved uh, again to the University of Maryland at this time as a professor, an assistant professor. And then I, so about nine years ago, I decided to go to Kobe where uh, they had the biggest supercomputer at that time. And now we again have the world's number one supercomputer. So I'm going to talk about what we have been exploring using those supercomputing resource. And those supercomputers process a lot of data. So um, that's a combination of the big data and the big com computation. And data assimilation, I, I will talk about it today, will combine the data and the computation. So I'm going to talk about that kind of thing today. So uh, my group is a data simulation research team. We have about 15 full-time scientists and a few students. And we, have, we are working on mainly uh, numerical weather prediction problem because of my background in meteorology. But we also explore different fields applying the data assimilation to various problems. Okay, so this is uh, what we did this year uh, in 2021, uh, July 30th, when we had the uh, Tokyo Olympic Games, and this is in Tokyo. And on this date, we had uh, heavy rain, and this is a web page of, of weather.weekend.jp that we had a real-time weather prediction like this, very detailed weather prediction. So at that time, we used the Fugaku. This is the biggest supercomputer uh, in the world at this moment. And uh, it, the last year, we also did a similar experiment. But this year, uh, Fugaku was full in full operations. So we took advantage of this computing power so that the last year we used the university computer uh, hosted by the University of Tokyo and Tsukuba University, the computer named Oak Forest Fax. And this is still a very powerful computer, but uh, Fugaku is it's much more powerful. So we increase the computation size by a factor of 20 like this, and also by a factor of 10. And so it's really a big computation. So we did a real-time prediction in 2021 during the period of Olympic and Paralympic Games. Unfortunately, not many people could go seeing those games on site, but uh, we produced our prediction using this Fugaku. Okay, so we, we use about 9% of Fugaku that has uh, half a million CPU cores. So this is an example on July 29th, we had a heavy rain here. This is a prediction and this is the actual observation. 
So as you can see that the prediction is quite uh, well, although uh, there are some differences. And also here we have uh, some rain system in the, the uh, downtown area of Tokyo and it decays. And the, the prediction of the decaying precipitation is also a challenge. And this is working very well. So if we look at the initial time of 7.20 p.m. local time in Tokyo. So this is our prediction data, but uh, this is basically the observation data. And this is the actual observation data. And this is 10 minutes later and 20 minutes and 30 minutes later. And we can see that this rain system here, some parts are intensified like this. So these red and yellow colors show a heavy rain. And we could predict this intensification of the precipitation system like this. And this is really difficult to do in the current uh, normal uh, New Mecca weather prediction system. So, so we could really achieve something unique at this time. So every 30 seconds, we get a new data and update the prediction. So every 30 seconds, we get a new prediction. So that's nowhere else uh, that kind of prediction has been done before. So this is the real time prediction that we did at this time. But if you look carefully, so this precipitation system, for example, is completely missing. So we are talking about very, very small scale. So we, we focus on the individual convective cloud. So it's really difficult to exactly predicts all the precipitation system like this. So that, that, that is a future challenge. So we need to improve the prediction like, like, like this part, but still this is quite um, impressive in a sense that um, nobody has done this type of prediction before. So this is again, uh, July 30th in the afternoon. And uh, this is a 30 minute, 30 minute lead forecast. So we initialize a prediction at 3 p.m. and this is a 3.30 p.m. Uh, observation. So we have a heavy rain like this in uh, downtown Tokyo area. And we could predict like this. And this is a probability prediction uh, over 30 millimeters per hour. Uh, this is supposed to be a heavy rain. So we have some chance of the heavy rain in the downtown area. So, so this is quite successful. We, we care about this type of prediction because this happened in 2008 in Kobe. Um, five people unfortunately died at this time. This river became like this only in 10 minutes. So this is really scary. And there are steps. So if we knew even like minutes ago, then people could escape like this. But at that time, we didn't have that warning system like that. So we, we really are motivated to improve the situation like this. And the, the climate change, the global climate change calls this type of heavy rain or sudden heavy rain uh, more probable and even increasing in the future. So this is a type of the risk that we face in, in, in the near future. Okay, so what, what is behind in, in this system? So we get the observations. In this case, we have a new radar system. I will talk about this uh, later, but this new radar system produce uh, orders of magnitude bigger data. So the, the regular uh, weather prediction system cannot take this, this data uh, in a proper way. And we have a big supercomputer and that can process the big data. So the idea is to combine these simulations using the big supercomputer with the orders of magnitude bigger data. So this is the actual real world data, and this is the virtual on the computer. So the data simulation is like a bridge combining the observations and the simulations. So here we have the K computer, and the K computer was the previous uh, the biggest supercomputer in Japan. And uh, it started the operations in 2012 when I moved to Kobe. And with this supercomputer, uh, my colleagues 
um, achieve this highest resolution global weather simulation. So this is really amazing. So um, it's a sub kilometer, so 870 meter mesh uh, global weather simulation. This is really, really amazing. So this has been done in, well, published in 2013. It's already eight years ago, but still, I, as far as I know, this is still the highest resolution global weather simulation. So what the K computer achieved was really great. And this is another new technology. So this is a new type of the radar. So we can see this type of the convective rain um, every 30 seconds. There is no gap anywhere because uh, this uh, this radar is a new type of the radar um, you might hear the noise from this movie um, so if you go into this dome you can see this radar system rotating with this noise and this produces a hundred times of more data because we can see a hundred levels in the vertical at the same time Although the, usually this type of the parabolic antenna radar can see only a single line, but this radar can see a hundred lines at the same time. That's why that's why we have a hundred times so more data. So the idea of data simulation is how to combine this um, high resolution simulation with the new sensor. So the data simulation is like the plus sign to combine. So by itself, it doesn't make sense. But if you have that's both sides, then we can do something better than either side. So again, so here is the system. So we combine the observations from the phase array with the high resolution simulation using the powerful supercomputer. And we developed the system in 2016. And we tested our system for this event. So we have 8 a.m. we have almost nothing but in five minutes 10 minutes we have really heavy rain and in 30 minutes we have so this is a, a Kobe city area so many people uh, one and a half million people live in the Kobe city area like here so many many people got affected by this heavy rain but at 8 a.m. nobody could predict that it happens like this so we applied our system. So on the top left is the observation. So this is the actual phase array radar observation. We have four uh, precipitation system. This is what we produced with our new system. And the bottom left is the normal um, weather prediction system. So we can see the very detailed structure of this type of the rain system. And again, this um, movie is available at this YouTube so if you are interested, uh, you could access here. And we have quite a large number of views. So if you could kindly uh, visit this YouTube movie, we could maybe change this number here today. Thank you very much. And then um, here is a snapshot of, of, uh, of the movie. So this is the 30 second update, big data assimilation system. We published um, our achievement here uh, in 2016 using the K computer. So we could produce this rain system like this, but it's observed it's here. And this is what is generated in the computer. So we can see the rain system, but in the computer we have all the other variables like the winds or temperature and humidity and other variables as well, consistently with what is observed in, in the clouds. And without this data simulation, we have no predictability at all, basically. The computer system cannot really produce what is observed. So this is what we developed. And for the Tokyo area, we had the new radar system, the phase array weather radar, but this is a, a multi-parameter. So MP represents a multi-parameter phase array weather radar. And that was developed by this another project called SIP. That's a, another Japanese government project. And it, it is located right north of Tokyo so that it covers the 60 kilometer radius, uh, in, including all, many 
uh, Olympic and Paralympic venues. So we developed our system to use this data to make the real-time prediction. So we get the data from the radar and within three seconds, so the data size is like a hundred megabytes. It's not really big per observation, but every 30 seconds we get this data. And within three seconds, this data is produced in the uh, local server in NICT. NICT owns this um, radar and operates it. So this data is produced in this server, and then we keep monitoring this server to have the new file generated. And once we identify this new file generated, then it immediately transferred to Fugaku. And it takes about uh, three seconds after observing this. So it's really quick uh, data transfer to Fugaku. Then we have our uh, modeling system to assimilate this data into our model and to produce the prediction and release, disseminate the prediction data through the web page and the smart, smartphone app application. It was really unfortunate that uh, there are no, almost no uh, foreign visitors to Tokyo at that time so that nobody could really see the prediction. So uh, we have um, every 30 seconds, we get the new data, but we need to provide the boundary conditions. So this is the innermost domain where we produce every 30 seconds updating prediction. But, uh, but pr to provide this uh, boundary data, we run a little bit lower resolution, one and a half kilometer resolution outer domain here. And this is initialized by the JMA mesoscale model at five kilometer resolution. So we get this data real time, and then we produce the prediction at one and a half kilometer mesh from the JMA mesoscale model. And then um, that will provide the boundary condition for the innermost domain. And we have the every 30 second phase array radar data within this domain so that we can update the prediction every 30 seconds. Here's, here is uh, how we, here, here it shows how we use the Fugaku supercomputer. So we uh, say, so for this inner domain, so here it shows the number of nodes that we use. So about 9,000 nodes are devoted to the innermost domain. And for the boundary condition, we use this part, about 2,000 nodes, total about 11,000 nodes. And each node has 64 cores. So that's why it's like half a million cores. So it continuously run all the time. And we produce this type of the, the image for the smartphone app so that people can see the real time prediction. So if the heavy rain comes or not. So uh, this shows a whole time series of the Olympic game period from um, the, the opening ceremony was on 24th of July and the closing ceremony was on uh, 8th of August. So this shows the lead time, forecast lead time. So we produce 30 minutes forecast within three, three minutes uh, processing time. That's why we have 27 minutes lead time. So this is quite uh, impressive in general. And uh, if we plot the histogram, so, so we issued total 47,000 prediction, every 30 seconds we issue new prediction. So for, only during this period, we produced 47,000 prediction, and most of the time it's more than 27 minutes of the lead time. So this was quite successful. And this is a Paralympic game period from 24th of um, August to 5th of September. And again, most of the time it was uh, good. But this gray period is when we had some trouble with a computer or something else so that we couldn't do the prediction in real time. But fortunately, we had no rain. So there was no, basically no impact. So here, uh, these blue curves show the area of the rain 
so that when we have rain most of the time we had a good prediction okay so i would like to talk more into detail about what is data assimilation this is the method uh, in numerical weather prediction so we have the observation the simulations and data assimilation combines them so data assimilation is like a plus sign and try to add value so here the observations are from the real world and it's inductive and data driven but the simulations are process driven and it's in the cyber world and it's deductive because we have the fundamental laws of the atmospheric motion and physics and then we have the equations to solve and the computers will solve the equations to simulate like the digital twin of the real world so the observations are limited and we need to combine these in the most e effective way okay the theory of data simulation is based on the dynamical systems and statistical mathematics and the UQ, um, uncertainty quantification. So data simulation is also considered as the synchronization of chaotic dynamical systems. So if you think one system is a nature, we, we never know what's the real state of the nature or the, the real um, physics or, or the complete um, equation for the nature, we never know. But uh, we have some representative system in our uh, computer that is a model. So we take some observation that's a limited transfer of the information from nature to the model. And we try to synchronize the nature with our model. So if you can synchronize, then the model can produce uh, the synchronized state with the nature. And that will enable us to produce the future prediction. So here is the theory of data simulation. So we discuss the stability of synchronization. If the synchronization is stable, then our model can synchronize with the nature. So what are the key players here? So one is the observations and data simulation method. If you have more accurate and dense and frequent observations, then uh, that has more attracting uh, power like this. So it makes the synchronization more stable. Or if we have more efficient, effective data simulation method, then that will also help stabilize the synchronization. On the other hand, if you have chaotic dynamical system, if you have instability in the dynamics, the strength of the chaos, then uh, it will de well, destabilize the synchronization. Also, the model never uh, it's perfect. So if you have more errors in the model or imperfections in the model, then uh, that will also uh, degrade the stability. So let's try to first understand what is the basic or well, the fundamental uh, theory of data simulation. So we first look at this simple system. So let's assume this n is a time. So if you give at time one, the value of X as 0.2, then we can compute this equation. We need to provide a value, specific value of this parameter A. So just assume A is four. We know that this simple equation gives a chaotic behavior. So if we provide the initial condition of 0.2 here, then we can compute like this. This is just a very simple Excel um, form. So it's, it's really simple to do this. And if we provide a slight, with slight noise here, uh, 0 0.2001, and then do the same thing. Then first, it, it seems very similar because it's similar here. But if you look at, for example, here, it's quite different. And if you plot that two time series on top of each other, at first, uh, the blue and red, the two time series, are uh, on top of each other. But at some point, it completely um, makes uh, different time series. So this is uh, known as the dynamical instability. It's the source of the chaos. So the problems of data simulation is that 
uh, we assume that this blue time series is something that we would like to estimate. But this red one doesn't know about it. So if we have no, da no data or no information transferred from the truth to this red time series, then it's it just uh, going apart to each other. But uh, let's assume that we have some noisy representation. We just assume that noisy observations of this blue time series, like these blue circles here. And just tell these blue circles to this red time series. Then this red time series uh, always go closer to the blue time series. So if we just use this blue time series it, within the observation noise and uh, with data simulation, the red time series is closer to this blue line than the noisy observation. So that's the advantage of data simulation. So what we did was like this. So at time n, we have some state, and then the model will produce the, the plus one time, n plus one time state that is known as a forecast. And then we have the observation, then the data simulation combines these forecasts with the observation like this and produce the next um, best estimate. So this is the feedback loop. So how do we combine the forecast with observation? So we consider the errors of these two data. So we assume that the forecast and the observations are independent source of information. And then we need to measure what, how much information the forecast has or how much information the observation has. So data simulation is considered as the mathematics of the errors. So we need to consider the errors. So that represents how much information is there. So then we combine these two information with data simulation, then we get smaller error uh, analysis. So this is the analysis has more information than the forecast or the observation because we combine these two information. How do we do it? It's a Bayesian estimation theory. So we have a PDF, the probability distribution like this, and the probability. So let's assume that this A is a prediction data and the B is the observed data so that we have some observation error. The noise is like this and the forecast is not perfect as well. So we have some error of the forecast. We need to know how much error the forecast has. And then we multiply these two distributions. That's a base theorem. So to get the better estimate based on these two independent information. So if we assume the Gaussian distribution, then the Gaussian function is written like this. So T is a variable, like, like this axis represents T, and TA is this, this value, and TB is this value, and sigma A is the, this noise, and sigma B is this noise, and we multiply these two, and we know that the multiplying two Gaussian functions uh, results in another Gaussian function. So that has a higher peak with smaller error. So if we see that, then this optimal so the combination of these two information will give us the weighted average here. And then uh, this um, error is smaller than either sigma A or sigma B like this. So it's more accurate analysis is obtained like this, if we assume the Gaussian error. So if things are non-Gaussian, it's not that simple. So just we stick to the Gaussian at this moment, but a Bayes theorem uh, can be applied to any distribution. So we can ex well, expand our theory to non-Gaussian regions. But that's, uh, yeah, that's a future issue at this moment. There are some studies. Okay, so what we do is that, so here is the true time series, and we would like to estimate the true time series. So we have some analysis to start our model simulation to represent the truth. But we get a forecast because of the chaos. If we continue the forecast, the forecast accuracy will, well, will be degraded. So the forecast will be less accurate. So we know that because if we we cannot rely on 
the long term weather prediction because of the chaos. So we take the observation and combine with the forecast to get the analysis and we just repeat this process. So this is known as a four dimensional uh, data simulations uh, because we, if you think about this analysis, this analysis is a combination of this forecast and the observation. It's the same here. And if you think about this forecast, this forecast is available because of this analysis. That means that this observation is included here. So what transfers in time is this model. So we take advantage of the physical process that we know. So that's a human knowledge about this model uh, that transfers this data in time. So that this analysis contains all the information of the previous observation. But again, the chaos makes the transfer of, of this, uh, the information in time in a limited way so that we always have some forgetting factor. So the chaos implies forgetting in time. So, but still, um, if we have frequent enough data, then all, all of these data can be transferred in time so that this analysis is accurate because we accumulate the observations in time. This is the idea of four dimensional data assimilation. So this is more general view to data assimilation. So we have the initial state and the simulation produces a simulated state. And then we compare with the observations and we combine these two to get the best estimate. Again, this feedback loop is an essential part of, of the data simulation. So what we do is that we get the data and then we understand the data and the human knowledge on the scientific activities uh, produce the equations. So those are the fundamental laws of this uh, system. So whatever system it is, in the case of weather prediction, we have the weather system so that we have um, the uh, fluid dynamics equations and also the, uh, some radiation process or other physics, uh, physical processes in the atmosphere. So those are the, the human science activities. So, so we derive the equations here and that produce the new information. And we get the information from the data itself. So, so this is another loop. Okay. So, uh, okay. So to, to do this data simulation, we need to have this green box. So, so this tells us what kind of observations can be integrated in this system. So that's, we don't need to observe exactly the simulated state. We, we can observe whatever uh, the function of the simulated state. So uh, for exa the example of the radar data, uh, we don't have the simulated radar state, but uh, we have the simulated rain, for example. Then based on the rain distribution, we can compute the observable, well, basically the simulates the observation data in the simulation world. So the simulation world is the virtual world that we produce in the computer. So we have the atmosphere, uh, the digital twin in the computer, then, then we need to put the radar in the digital twin. Then uh, we can simulate what the radar would observe those digital twin in the simulated world. And that can be compared with the real world observations. So any data uh, that can be simulated in the computer, can be integrated into this system, okay? So the data assimilation is quite powerful. So I talked about the prediction and also the state estimation, but the data assimilation always monitors the difference between the observation and the simulation so that we can um, estimate the model error or bias, or it, you can even estimate the model parameters those un uncertain parameters in the model, uh, we can estimate it to minimize the difference between the observations. And also what is powerful is to integrate the various data. So the data are just data. So we have different types of sensors uh, providing us uh, really different types of data. So the satellite observes the radiations, but the radiations are not simulated here. But um, Again, we can simulate the satellite within this digital twin, then we can integrate 
So you can integrate radar data and the thermometer, for example, or, or whatever you observe at, about the atmosphere and integrate it into this variable. So this variable is what we design. This is designed by the simulation that's a human knowledge. So this is really clean, uh, regular uh, data, homogeneous, but the observations are in homogeneous, heterogeneous, and uh, it's not easy to, to deal with. So, so this is quite powerful. So um, as I said, what is important in data simulation is to know the errors in the model and also the errors in, in the data itself. So this is an attempt to, to analyze the errors in the model in a better way. So just to increase the sample size. So usually for the weather simulations, we use about 100 parallel simulations. So we have 100 parallel Earths and to see how different all those uh, parallel Earths and see the range of the errors. But now uh, because of our computational resource, we explored the 100 times bigger uh, ensemble size. So this is a big ensemble data simulation. We, we published the, this result in the journal Computer, IEEE journal. And if you are interested in more details, you can see this uh, paper here. Uh, but the, these individual dots here represent the complete atmospheric state. And if we magnify these 16 here, uh, we can see these slightly different atmospheric state. This shows a uh, 500 millibar temperature. So the, north, well, the tropics is warmer and uh, the poles are cooler. But we can see these waves are slightly different, particularly in the southern hemisphere over the ocean because we have fewer data there. We cannot uh, estimate those states very well. But in the Northern Hemisphere, we have more data. So these are more similar, something like that. So we can estimate, or well, we can plot the histogram using those samples. So this is a histogram with 20 samples and 10,000 samples. Clearly, we can see better resolution of this histogram. That gives us a better idea about what kind of error uh, is included in the model. So if you have observation, then we know how to combine with this uh, model data with the observation. So this is um, this shows the non-Gaussian metric, the kullback library divergence from the Gaussian distribution. So we, we see occasional non-Gaussian structure with this large sample size. But if we have smaller sample size, because of just sampling error, uh, we see a lot of non-Gaussian uh, structure. But that's not true because of the sampling. So once we have about 1,000 uh, sample size, uh, the non-Gaussian PDF is well captured. So this is a um, um, good finding, uh, only possible by running the large ensemble. So with large ensemble, so if we look at how this observation of this star can propagate in space, the large ensemble, we can see the long range propagation of the impact of this observation. But this long range propagation of this impact with smaller ensemble size is known as the sampling error. This, these are considered as fake. So, but this is the first time ever that we found these long range correlations clearly by running this large ensemble. So by running the large ensemble, this has a potential. This is an idealized experiment, not a real world numerical weather prediction, but at least in the idealized experiment, we could improve the prediction. One day prediction error will be the same as a five day prediction error like this. So compare with 80 ensemble members or 10,000 ensemble members. So 80 is a typical choice in the, the real world numerical weather prediction. Uh, but just by increasing the ensemble members, uh, it's quite a lot. But still, those long range uh, error correlations play the role so that we could improve uh, tomorrow's prediction accuracy can be achieved by more 
for the five day prediction accuracy. This is quite amazing. So what we have explored so far was the combination of big data and big simulations using this supercomputer K um, with two orders of magnitude bigger, uh, basically the, the computer size, computing problem size. So here is the ensemble size, as I said, usually it's a 100, so it's 10,000. And the update is usually one hour update. It's considered to be fast enough, but uh, 120 times more frequent. And the resolution also is usually one kilometer resolution. It's considered to be high resolution in numerical weather prediction, but 100 meters and uh, it's a, a square mesh. So it's a hundred times more uh, grid points per, per unit area. So it's all two orders of magnitude bigger computation to explore the future of new mega weather prediction. Okay, so I'm going to uh, talk a little more about what the data simulation can, can do. So we can simulate new type of observation network. So this is a virtual uh, observation network. We don't have it, but uh, just assume that we have this many phase array with data. We don't have it, but if we if we have it, then how much improvement that we can make? So this is known as an observing system simulation experiment. So to do this, it's really costly, but to to just test this in a simulation, it's feasible. So we had a very heavy rain last year in July. And this caused a lot of disaster in this area. And we simulated the case. So this is considered as the truth. So we had a very heavy rain here. Right? And this is the one hour prediction and two hour prediction. And without assimilating that phase array radar, we had heavy rain predicted, but shifted considerably to the south. But uh, with assimilating this data, we could improve the prediction quite a bit. So this is actual disaster site. And we had heavy rain predicted in this disaster site one hour in advance. And two hours in advance, it's not as quite, but still much better than without assimilating this data, radar data. So if we consider the size of the disaster, it may so we need to be careful, but still we, we, we could consider more about the feasibility of, of investing for, for this type of the new observing network. It's quite costly, but if you consider the type of the disasters, then uh, this prediction might produce even uh, better results. Okay. And this is another example of observing system simulation experiment. We already have these satellites the phase array radar on board the satellite. And we are thinking if it's, it's feasible to do this, to put a, a phase array radar of 30 meters square like this on the geostationary orbit. The advantage of the geostationary orbit is that we can observe the same point continuously. So very frequently. So this is an advantage. So we could simulate a typhoon. This is considered as the nature. And we, we never know the real nature. But if we observe using the 30 meter square um, phase array radar in the geostationary orbit, we could observe like this. So it's not as high resolution as the nature, and, but we could still see something. But if we have the same uh, radar, uh, but uh, do the oversampling. So it's oversampling means that we are over well, scanning on the overlapping regions. Then we could get uh, a better image like this. And if you look at the vertical slice, this is the nature run, and this is the typhoon clouds. And without oversampling, we could see only this. It's better than nothing, but uh, with oversampling, it's much better. So we assimilated this data with or without oversampling, or even without this uh, radar at all. 
and uh, simulated the strength of this typhoon. So this is the 18 hour prediction of the typhoon and the actual typhoon in the simulation had a very uh, high winds, like more than 54 meters per second high winds. And without assimilating this uh, precipitation radar, uh, this head, well, strong, intense winds were not well predicted. But we, yeah, we, we could improve the prediction quite significantly. So data simulation really combines the observation simulation at, at Bali in different fields as well. So this is a case of ocean environment. We have a geostationary satellite observes the ocean surface temperature, the sea surface temperature uh, look like this, but uh, we have some white spots or band like this because the clouds cover and the infrared cannot uh, trans transmit through clouds. So we cannot see it from the, the satellite. The simulation can do something, but it doesn't really match. So with data simulation, we can combine these two and we can reproduce all the data uh, even under the clouds. So, so this is good. And also the lake environment, we explored the blue green allergy bloom in lakes. So we have some particle tracking of the lake motion and we have a satellite observation uh, known as Shikisai, providing the ocean color, uh, so the lake color in this case. Then we can combine these two. So this is still uh, in progress, but we, we are working on the data simulation like this. And also we had the forest uh, simulation like this. So in each individual tree is simulated like this. And we have the satellite observed leaf area index. And with data simulation, um, so we, we could produce this. So the idea is to produce all individual trees in Siberia, like this. So, so each individual tree is not exactly what, is, what exists in the real Siberia. But uh, if you look at the leaf area, of, of some region like this, then it really agrees well with the satellite observation. This is useful if we design some management strategy or policy for the ecosystem. And another example is, uh, is the press forming. So we have some metal uh, to form like this. And it's really hard to know the final shape of the press form, so that we need to do a lot of experiments to decide what kind of uh, press forming parameters are suitable for, for example, to producing this kind of parts. So that raises a lot of cost uh, for, for producing, for example, this car, because you have a lot of press forming here, yeah, and each parts requires all the experiments. But if you can do accurate uh, prediction by data simulation within the simulation, then that accelerates the production um, process and also that uh, reduce the cost significantly. So another thing is the cellular automata. We have many examples and I will not go into detail, but this is known as a chaotic cellular automata so that it moves. So it's like a sheep is eating grass. And so the green part is a grass and the white thing is a sheep. So that, and the, the brown part is just a bare land. So, so this, this continues moving like this. And we observe like partially and, and with some noise. So that we cannot make the perfect observation, but uh, this partial observation can reproduce that true image very well. So without observation at all, the analysis like this, and this is a true image on the top left, and this is a difference. But if we observe only partially, like 70%, our analysis with data simulation really agreed well with the true image. We observe only this. And if you observe more, then it's more accurate. 
So this is the difference between the truth and our analysis. So that there are some differences, although it's very similar, but these differences are getting lower like this. So this might have some implications to apply to other, other areas. Okay, so we had a K computer. Um, this was good for big data simulation, as I showed. So we developed a big data simulation uh, weather prediction system using the K computer, but this was not suitable for machine learning applications. But now we have a new uh, Fugaku. Uh, this is good for the big data simulation as we did uh, in the Tokyo Olympic and Paralympic games, we did uh, the numerical weather prediction, but this is also good for the machine learning. So if you think about the scientific methods, it started from just observing the real nature or experiments, and then we get the data. And the first science is known as experimental, so that we analyze the data. So the data may not be perfect, but we get the fundamental laws or knowledge based on the data. So the second science is known as theoretical. So this theory produced a new knowledge. And the third science is known as computational. So we can, we, we, we can use our knowledge to make some simulation and we can do the computation beyond human ability. And that produces some new data to analyze and produce new knowledge. So that's the third science. And the fourth science is known as data centric science. So we have the big data beyond human ability so that uh, analyzing the big data, uh, we get uh, new knowledge. So that's the data centric science. So and data simulation uh, by design combines the observation and simulation. So what I have been thinking recently was to combine the third science, well, the previous scientific um, methods and to propose what we call the fifth science. That's the combination of data and computation. So to explore the idea, so we explore the integration of data simulation and artificial intelligence. So this, or I already showed the algorithm of data simulation, but a number of parts we can use these uh, new AI type of te techniques. So for example, we had a numerical weather prediction system with a big computation. We can produce a future image like this, but we have a record of the past image. So we can learn, um, train the machine learning algorithms, the neural networks using the past time series and also the future time series given by numerical weather prediction and to improve the prediction. So this idea was quite successful. So this shows the skill of the weather, uh, the rain prediction. And uh, this scale here is the pure numerical weather prediction. Yeah, this pink line. And the black is a persistence. So this is purely data driven. And we have the optical flow algorithm, a simple data driven method that is blue. But this red dashed line is a combination of the long short short term memory. So that's a kind of a neural network with this scale prediction. So it's significantly improved the predictive skill. And another thing is to accelerate the model here because the model is very expensive. That's why we need the supercomputer using the machine learning. So we explored how to accelerate the climate model computation by machine learning. I will not go into detail, but this is still a proof of concept stage. So we use a simple cogi geostrophic model that looks like this and purely data-driven uh, model or the hybrid physical and statistical model or purely the process-driven uh, expensive model. And this is the results of the accuracy. So the higher, the better. 
this blue one is when we use the expensive physical based model. So this is the best so far. And the red one is a purely data driven so that it, the skills drop quickly. So this is a forecast uh, lead time. So this is a long uh, 120 days here uh, because this is a Koji geostrophic model. And this blue one, the light blue one is what we achieved using the hybrid approach. And the hybrid approach here is much faster. This is a computational time. And this blue one is corresponds to the expensive model. And this one, red one here, is the cheapest model, the statistical data-driven model. And with a hybrid, we still need to run the low resolution model, but we can fill in the gap with a high resolution model using the low resolution model. So it's still um, more expensive than the purely data driven, but still it's much faster than running the high resolution model. Um, yeah, I, I will skip this part. So this is almost the end of my talk. So uh, as a future uh, perspective, so at this moment, we try to use the AI techniques in data simulation, but we have been communicating or working together with those um, AI scientists and found that there are many in common. So we would like to fuse the AI and data simulation with the high performance computation. So this will lead to the new method new methods in meteorology, what we call the fifth science methods. So we already started some activities uh, like, like that direction. So we, what we call is a prediction science or predictive sciences. So there are inductive and deductive approaches. As I said, the experimental science is deductive based on the data and data centric. The fourth science is also deductive. But the theoretical is inductive and also the computational science is usually inductive. So what we try to do is combine all of these and to produce something, a new approach to the science. So we already started the activity. We have a web page here. Uh, we hired several scientists, still hiring more. So if you know someone um, might be interested, uh, please visit this web page so that we have the, so the idea of this uh, predictive science. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope that I still, um, yeah, keep, keep my time. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Takamasa-san, uh, for this uh, very exciting overview of all the work being carried at the data simulation team. Um, I'm, I'm conscious of time. We will try to uh, wrap up uh, at eleven eight. If you do have a question, please feel free to raise your hand and unmute yourself. Otherwise, uh, I'll jump to my questions because I have quite a few. Now the question so far. So um, I had one question about the uncertainty quantification um, parts, uh, which you you went over very quick one, maybe we can take some of it offline, but uh, you've shown that example of fusing with a Bayesian approach uh, to distribution. And it seems that this relies uh, on the assumption that the noise, for example, the nature and the noise of the observations are, for example, Gaussian, because then it makes the, uh, the competition actually tractable. How, how do you manage uh, if you don't make that assumption? Is this um, in any way solved? by approximation, because you did mention also an increased compute power in that cases. And, and you did mention later on the callback libel divergence as a tool to measure the discrepancy between Gaussian's distributions. Does this also apply to non-Gaussian? Thank you very much for your question. So in numerical weather prediction, so far, most of the methods assume the Gaussian distribution. But apparently we have strongly non-Gaussian variables like precipitation, for example. Precipitation never go negative, as you know. And most of the time, precipitation is zero. That means that we have delta function at zero. So this is quite really difficult to treat in the statistical theories. And what we do is to apply variable transformation or, or some anamorphosis to change the distribution. 
to, to be Gaussian so that we can treat as Gaussian variable. But there are some other uh, methods that directly consider the non-Gaussian distributions. So uh, to do that, um, we need, ideally, need more samples to know the higher order statistics. So uh, Gaussian distribution is simple because we know we just need to know two parameters. One is the mean and the other is the right. standard deviation. But if you would like to know the skewness or even higher uh, degrees of the statistics, then we need more samples. So by increasing the samples, we can apply non-Gaussian data simulation methods. Another approach is still keeping the sample size small, but we try to reduce the degrees of freedom for estimation. So that's another approach. So, so we call it the localization to limit the range of the variables uh, within some local area of the whole variable uh, possibilities. So, that, that, so, so we are now developing what we call the local particle filter. A particle filter is a um, kind of non-Gaussian uh, data assimilation method. And, but that requires really huge sample size. Uh, but we try to limit the sample size by applying the idea of localization. So that's something ongoing as a frontier research. Right. Thank you very much. That's definitely very exciting. There's one question from uh, Ratikan Selim in the Q&A. Uh, Ratikan, if, you, if you'd like to unmute yourself, or shall I just ask a question? So the question is, isn't it in a way that has simulation in small scale, like data imputation? Sorry, small scale? Is, is data simulation uh, similar on a smaller scale uh, to data imputation? Sorry, I, I don't know about the da data imputation. But again, if you, if you hear us and can unmute yourself, you're very welcome to elaborate on your question. I hope you can hear me. So we have to like um, unmute them. So I'll, I'll find you if you can unmute you. Right. Thank you, Myra. Imputation. I, I don't know in, about in, data in, imputation. In, in the meantime, maybe we can move on to another question from uh, Ekehard Batsis in the chat. This patient approach of merging observations with simulation you showed at the beginning, is this the Kalman filter approach? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a Kalman filter approach. So if you assume the Gaussian uh, linear uh, evolution, then it's exactly the Kalman filter. Brilliant. Right. Right. And like with Vatican. Yes, thank, thank you very much, Professor, for your talk. Uh, thank you very much. I mean, the data imputation is like we 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 try to get uh, when we get to the problem of missing value in a very small scale, not that your scale, and then we try to impute. We try to put the the value in in the the missing one. Is it the same thing? Um, yeah, so if we can get the, well, the prediction data should include the complete coverage. So even if the data is missing, the simulation data includes everything. So when the data is missing, we do the best based on what we get from the prediction data. So if the data right. is missing all the time, then um, so we, we could still get something from the, the surrounding data because it propagates in, in space usually. Yo, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Do we have any other question? It is one minute past. 11 a.m. GMT, which is also 8 p.m. Japan time. So we'll try to wrap it up. Now the questions. Yes, one question. 
what would be a good first literature to get into this approach of using machine learning for this data assimilation? That's a good question. I, so this is really an ongoing research. And I know there are a number of research ongoing in different places, but still uh, there is no good point of reference at this moment. So, so this is really an exciting field at this moment. And yeah, the best place maybe just to attend at some meeting to talk directly to those relevant people. As a member of the editorial board of the Data Centric Engineering Journal, I would very much like to invite you to submit a survey to the journal on that topic. <laughs> that will serve as a great reference. Yeah, that, that's a good opportunity. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Uh, Thank you very much, Asujat. We wrap it up uh, to, to stick to the time. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Takamasa san for your brilliant talk and this very exciting overview of what your group has been working over the past few years. Uh, thank you very much to everyone for attending. Uh, as you know, the recording will be shared on the Data Centric Engineering website uh, and also on the YouTube channel in the upcoming days. Uh, stay tuned with the DC seminar uh, series. We have our next sections on November 17th. Uh, with uh, with uh, Philip Jonathan from Shell and Lancaster Universities. Thank you very much and see you soon. Thank you very much.